Bible this morning to John chapter 14. I want to share something that the Lord began to speak to my heart about this week out of that scripture. And I'm sure that for most of you it is very familiar scripture. You've heard it before. For those of you who haven't, if you stay around church very long, you will. Amen? It's used in funerals. It's used a lot for encouragement. Yes. And I praise the Lord for it. John chapter 14 begins like this. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Now if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. That is why it is so easy for a Christian to dream and think and put their mind on heaven and the things of heaven because of the promises that are found in the Word of God. Let us pray. Our Father, as we come to you this morning, I thank you for this church. I thank you for every person that's under the sound of my voice today. I pray, God, that now as we look into your blessed Word, that you would have your way in this service. You know the needs that are present. I pray, God, that not one of us would leave here with a need in our heart and our life that has not been met. I know, God, that you can meet our needs. I pray, Lord, that you would use me this morning under the anointing and the unction of the Holy Ghost of God that I might preach that would be pleasing in your sight. And I will glorify you and I will praise you for the results. For it's in Jesus' name that I ask it. Amen and amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord this morning. As I begin to think on our church and the things that are coming in this next year, God brought me to this scripture, and I, you know, I can, I've used it time and time again at funerals and other things, and I can quote it by heart. But God urged me to open the scriptures and look at it. And I began to read through it and I began to study what God was saying through his son, Jesus Christ. And God focused me on verse number two and the first four words. God wanted me to share with you some thoughts this morning about in my father's house. Now verse 1 says, let not your heart be troubled. And I begin to think about this and pray about it and I ask myself, why would Jesus make that statement and then say, in my father's house? Read a story recently about a man that was getting on up in years, and uh, his brother passed away, and he left him a million dollars. This man had worked hard all of his life, and he'd gotten by on meager funds, and he was getting older, and uh, so his children got concerned about how to tell him that he was a rich man. So one of them come up with a solution. Let's go get the pastor. He's been trained to break news to people and explain to people things without shocking them because the kids were afraid that if they told him that now that he's an old man, that he's a millionaire, that it would shock him and he'd have a heart attack. He already had a bad heart. So they called him the pastor and the pastor agreed and he goes over to visit with old John and he sits down and, and just makes some small talk for a little while and then he gets around to why he's there. He wants to break the news to John that his brother has passed away and has left him a million dollars. 
And so the preacher very calmly and, and very discreetly, you know, just kind of breaks it to him in a quiet manner. And he said, John, what do you think about that? What would you do? What are you going to do with that million dollars? John thought for a minute very soberly. And he said, you know, he said, I've lived most of my life. He said, I'll soon be gone. I would probably just give to the church. The pastor fell over dead of a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't ready for that one, right? No. <laughs> So we have to be concerned. I probably wouldn't join him. In this. <laughs> okay. I believe Jesus made that statement this morning. Let not your heart be troubled because of this. A troubled spirit or a fear of current or future conditions can stop your witness cold. And you see, the reason that that family called the pastor in to break the news to John was they was afraid of how John was going to react to it. And all too often, we are afraid to witness because of how we feel like people might react to it. But you have to understand this morning that our enemy, the devil, is the sinister minster of fear and a troubled spirit. How many of you know that fear doesn't come from God? Right. It comes from the enemy. That's right. As has already been said this morning, Sister Janie touched on it. Everybody gets on my message here later. <laughs> <coughs> but we look around at world conditions and we have a tendency to be troubled and concerned about what's going on. And I believe that that's why Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. You see, what I see here is a current condition and a future condition all enrolled in one. And I believe what the Lord was trying to tell us in that scripture is, we need not be troubled about what's going on in this world. We need not be concerned about what comes into our lives if we are trusting in Almighty God and we've surrendered it all to the Lord and it's in His hands and in His control. There's nothing, nothing, nothing according to Scripture that can separate us from the love of God. Amen. And I believe the reason that He would tell us let not your heart be troubled or fear not is that fear <coughs> degrades the Lord. You see, fear, if we are trusting in the Lord, if we have our faith in Him, Scripture says God is not a man that He can lie. <coughs> God has promised to care for us and take care of us, protect us, so when we begin to fear, we get, begin to be troubled in spirit and in heart over things that are going on in our life, that is an insult to his sovereignty. The Bible teaches us that he's in control, but our troubled spirit and our fear says, no, he's not. It's an insult to his providence because According to the scripture, if we'll surrender ourselves to him, he will guide us every step of the way. How many of you believe God will guide you every step? Amen. Every step. But if we become troubled and we become fearful in our life and the things that are going on, fear says he doesn't really guide me. It's an insult to his power to protect us because fear says he can't protect us. But I'm here to tell you he can. And that's why Jesus said to us, let not your heart be troubled. And then in the next verse says, in my father's house are many mansions. You see where he covered this life and the future life. All in two verses of scripture. You see, fear 
destroys our life. How many of you know that fear brings torment into your life? Fear brings a snare or a trap into your life. The devil, the enemy, wants to catch you in depression and fear and get you crippled to the point that you can't have joy and you can't have peace in your life. And you can't demonstrate that and be a witness. So Jesus begins this scripture in John 14 with, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And then he says, In my Father's house. Verse 1 is present tense. Verse 2 is future tense. You see, the message in both verses is this. Stay in the Father's house. Mm -hmm. yeah. Amen. Jesus told Peter, he said, Upon this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. God said the safety, the security is in the Father's house. Have you noticed that in so many instances when trouble comes, when fear comes, when people develop a troubled spirit, the first thing they want to do is quit church. But Jesus is saying, in my Father's house are many mansions. People's first reaction is to forsake the Lord, when things begin to go wrong, they want to quit. Jesus is saying to us, stay in the Father's house. Why? Because first of all, there is redemption in the Father's house. Redeemed for us means that we were purchased back from an enemy and a price was paid for us. In other words, when somebody is kidnapped, there's usually a motive behind that, and that motive is ransom. And the kidnapper will kidnap some rich person's daughter or son or wife or husband, and then they send a note that says, for X amount of dollars, I will turn them loose. Usually it don't happen that way. You see, that's what the enemy has done. He's kidnapped you and I, caught us in a trap, and he's saying to the Lord, if you want them back, you're going to have to pay a price, and that price was the blood of the only begotten Son of God on the cross of Calvary. And with that blood, he ransomed me, or he paid the ransom for me Amen. and for you. Yes. And that ransom is found... <coughs> Not in the answers that the world has, but in the Father's house. <laughs> There's redemption in the Father's house. There is encouragement in the Father's house. There's a reason that the Lord told us to forsake not the assembling of ourselves together as a matter of some is. And even so much more as you see that day approaching because he knew there was a snare out there and a trap out there for you. And there were going to be times when trouble and heartache would be in your heart and in your spirit. And you would need somebody to say, you can make it. You're going to make it. Everything's going to be all right. This is going to work out. Somebody to say to you, this too shall pass. It's going to be well. You're going to smile again. You're going to worship again. You're going to praise again. You're going to be happy again. Joy will once again fill your spirit. You need that encouragement. That's why Jesus is saying it's found in my Father's house. Salvation is found in the Father's house. Guidance and direction from the Holy Spirit is found not in the world but in the Father's house. The worst thing you can do is quit 
when the going gets tough. Amen? Amen. I got more good news for you. Deliverance is found in the Father's house. Yes. Oh, I know that the world has Alcoholics Anonymous and Al Anon and Alateen and all of these facilities where they want to bring folks down off of the habit forming drugs and alcohol that they've gotten involved with and has taken over their life. All that's out there for the world. But once you go through their program, that's it. That's the end. But I'm here to tell you this morning that in the Father's house, there's deliverance. Amen. I've seen people who come forward at a church service who were reeked, their, their breath and their whole body reeked of alcohol. And they were in under the influence of that when they came forward. And we have prayed and laid hands on them, Daryl, and I have seen them walk out sober and delivered and never, ever, ever touch it again. There's deliverance. In the Father's house. You see, I have seen drug addicts who couldn't shake the drug. I would be honest enough to tell you they can't quit. They can't leave it alone. It just, it just, they have to have it all the time. And no matter what the program does, it'll get you off it for a while. But after a while, that urge, that desire is so strong that you'll go back. And I've seen God deliver those people from the desire of those drugs and take a life that was totally out of control and, and a life that was the enemy had absolutely destroyed. And reunite and rebuild that life. Amen. And rebuild families and put mamas and daddies back together and bring children back into that family. I've seen the Holy Spirit of God take over folk like that and make a difference in their life. And that kind of an answer is only found in the Father's house. Yes. Not found in the, world. the world doesn't have that answer. So Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me, in my Father's house. That's what we're talking about this morning, is the Father's house. Amen? The worst thing you can do when it seems like that everything around you and everything involved in your life is falling apart and it's all broken and there's no answer and there's no hope and everything's going wrong, the worst thing you can do is leave the Father's house. Yeah. Amen. I think about the prodigal son. We all know the story of how he wanted his share of his inheritance and the Bible teaches us that he left home and he spent all that on riotous living. And folk, I'm here to tell you that that's the story of most of them. We went out in the world and we thought we could do it on our own and we tackled that and tried it. We made terrible mistakes and went terrible directions, but to make a long story short, that prodigal son ended up in a hog pen. Wanted to eat the slop that he was feeding the hogs. And you know what he did? It come to him. How, much, how many servants in my father's house have food and to spare and I suffer for them? Folk, it's in the father's house. If you leave the father's house, you're leaving everything that God gave you. Everything that God supplied to you. And that young man down there in the depths of despair, maybe only if he'd have been alive today, he'd have been on drugs and alcohol and, and whatever else there was available. But he was down there in a the hog pen, knee deep in mud, and he finally realized it's in the Father's house. It's in the Father's house. Deliverance is in the Father's house. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled, because the answer's in the Father's house. Unity is found in the Father's house. You know why this nation at this point in our history is destined to failure? I can tell you this morning, 
according to the word of God, there's no unity in our leadership. Everybody in leadership is on their own and they're out for themselves. And nobody cares about anybody else. They're all pushing their own agenda and there's no unity. And the Bible said a house divided against itself cannot stand. You vote in a Republican or a Democrat or an Independent, I don't care. As long as we're divided, it will not matter. We're going down. You know what the Bible says? Unity is found in the Father's house. That's where you come to church and you find people who care about you and they're genuinely concerned about how you're doing, amen, and how everything's going in your life and they want to pray for you and they want to lift you up and carry your name and your situation before God because there's unity and love in the Father's house. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me in my Father's house. In my Father's house is the answer. Whatever the problem, whatever the situation is in your life. The only reason people will not accept that is because they're still at the point where they think they can work it out for themselves. How many of you realize this morning you cannot solve your problems? Yes. You don't have the answer to your problems, but God does. Yes, he does. God does. Yes. <clears throat> God does. But these are all, all the things that I've been talking to you about are present tense. <coughs> the greatest benefit of the Father's house is not verse 1, although it's a good verse that says, let not your heart be troubled. It's not verse 2 that says, in my Father's house are the answers, but it's verse 3. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am. Everything that I have talked about up to now is present tense, but I see a future tense in that. I see a God who if we trust Him and stay in the Father's house, there will come a time when life on this earth is over and we close our eyes and say goodbye to our loved ones and friends. But Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go, and I'm going to prepare a place for you. Listen, if I can trust Him with my addictions, if I can trust Him with my life, if I can trust Him with my marriage, then here I am to say to you this morning, I can trust Him in death when He said, I've gone to prepare a place for you. Yes. And if I go and prepare that place, I'm going to come again and receive you unto myself that where I am. There you may be also. Amen. See, hallelujah. Not only is the answer to this life in the Father's house, but the life after this one, the answer is in the Father's house. Amen. Jesus said, I'm going to go prepare a place for you. <coughs> I've chosen you. I've put you on this earth. I've got a purpose for you. And that purpose is to witness to a lost and a dying world and be a witness to those who are hurting and those who are suffering and those who need salvation and those who need deliverance and those who need unity and those who need an answer. Be a witness to them and there will come a day after I've prepared you a place that I will come again. Yes, amen. I will come again amen. and receive you unto myself that where I am, there, you may be also. Hallelujah. You know, I believe that this scripture says to us, at least it says to me, we should be radical about the Father's house. Amen? It hurts me. It hurts my heart. It hurts my spirit when I hear people run down God's house. When they say critical things about church, whether it be theirs 
or somebody else's. That hurts me because God's here. Through his son, the answer is in the Father's house. Yes. I think we should be radical about protecting and standing up for God's house because God has provided the answer for this world. But it's up to us to get it out there too. It's up to us to proclaim it and to tell the world. That's why that song that they sang this morning, I surrender all, all to Jesus. I surrender is so important. Because you will never be radical about the Father's house until you're surrendered to the Father. Amen? Think about this. <coughs> Jesus went to the temple. You guys need to get ready. I'm going to close. Jesus went to the temple one day. And when he walked up to the temple, the Bible tells us that there were money changers there. And to just say that there were money changers there is a very vague description of what was going on. Because you see, in the, the Jewish religion... God had taught his children about daily sacrifices. And without getting so long that all of you get up and leave, I want to tell you that those daily sacrifices involved pigeons and, and raising sacrificial animals that were without spot and without blemish, and it was the people's responsibility to bring those animals for daily sacrifice. But you know what? That's a lot of work. And those people were busy people. They, they had jobs and they had things to do. So how many of you have heard the law of supply and demand? So here's what happened. There were some entrepreneurs, inspiring people that said, you know what? It would be easier for you if I just bring sacrifices in a cage and I will send you one when you need. Now that's what was going on. The people that were exchanging the money were actually selling prayers. Sacrifices. And the Bible said that when Jesus saw this, he became angry. How many of you know the Bible said be angry and sin not? The Bible teaches me that our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, weaved a cat of nine tails, and he walked into that temple where those people were selling prayers, overturned the tables, chased them out of the temple, and said, My house, yes. the Father's house, is meant to be a house of prayer, and you have made it a den of thieves. Folk, I'm here to tell you today that I believe that's going on more and more in the Father's house. You think people are not selling prayers today? Have you ever heard this statement from the television? If you will send 4923, I will pray Isaiah 4923 over your life, and God will do this. Honey, they're doing it, and people are falling for it. But I'm here to tell you that God's house, the Father's house, is meant to be a house of prayer, a house of restitution, a house of deliverance, a house where people can come and get salvation and deliverance from their heartache and their trouble. We have made it a den of thieves, and I stand against that. And I pray that you do. We should be radical in protecting God's house. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me in my Father's house. Are many mansions. It's the Father's house, folks. Stay in the Father's house. Stay in the Father's house. You'll find deliverance there. You'll find answers to your life there. You'll find something being taught there about your future. And I'm not talking about next week or next month, but I'm talking about your future. Amen. A thousand years from now. 
I plan on standing on the hillsides of glory and shouting and praising my Lord. Why? Because Jesus has gone to prepare me a place. And when he gets it prepared, he's coming back, Loretta. He's coming back to receive me unto himself that where he is. I can be also. But it all starts in the Father's house. Amen. Committed and radical is what God's looking for in this day. Defending the Father's house. Stand to your feet. If you're here today and you have a need in your life, whatever that need is, I'm here to tell you the answer is found in the Father's house. It's not found in the world system. If you have health issues, the doctors can only treat the symptoms. They cannot give you an answer. But the answer is found in the Father's house. James 5, 14 says, Any sick among you, let him call the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil, and a prayer of faith will save the sick. If you need deliverance today. You know, the worst thing in the church is people that need deliverance, but they're afraid to admit it. Yeah. Yeah. Because they're afraid somebody will think wrong of them. Folk, if you need deliverance, it's in the Father's house. Yes. Amen. The heck with what other people say. If they are right with God, they ain't going to say nothing. They're going to rejoice with you. Amen. And if they're not right with God, they need as much deliverance as you do. Amen. But if you need deliverance, if you need healing, maybe you need a financial miracle. The answer's in the Father's house. The Bible said, yea, will a man rob God? But you've robbed me. And they said, well, Lord, where have we robbed you? With time. And offerings. The Bible said, Give and it shall be given unto you. Press down, shaking together, running over. Well, preacher, you don't understand. There's too much month left at the end of my money. Yeah. I can tell you why. You're not giving God his share. Amen. You see, God owns it all anyway, and he only asks you to sow 10% back into his ministry so that he can have. The ability to give you a harvest. If you don't sow no seed, what's the result? No harvest. You ain't going to get no harvest. Zero. Amen. Zero. Hear me, folks. We need to be radical about